I come from a long line of immigrants. <laughs> I was born in Venezuela to a Syrian family and grew up in Miami. <laughs> Conversations at home were a mix of English, Spanish, and Arabic. And the question, where are you from, never had a quick answer for me. But food was how I understood my identity. Every special occasion in my family required a huge batch of stuffed grape leaves. My mom used to pack hummus in my lunchbox before it was trendy. <laughs> and to this day, the scent of milk simmering on the stove reminds me of my grandmother, Setomune. I remember sitting on the counter of her tiny kitchen in Caracas, watching her prepare rizb halib, the Middle Eastern version of rice pudding. She taught me how to transform humble ingredients into a delicious meal. Once the milk thickened, she would turn off the stove, wait a few moments, and then add a tiny splash of rose water and orange blossom water to the pot. Don't add it too early, she used to warn me. You don't want to dilute the flavors. To this day, I make Rizb Halib the way she taught me 25 years ago. These experiences shaped my perception of food. They taught me that food is more than just eating. And those moments with my grandmother, they weren't just about rice pudding. While I was sitting on her counter, my grandmother made me feel like the most important person in the world. There's a saying in Arabic, between us, there's bread and salt. I love this expression because it highlights the social role food plays in our lives. It speaks to the power of a shared meal. And despite this, the world continues to move towards faster and more outsourced food options. With a couple swipes on our phone, we can have food delivered to our doors without even needing to speak with a single human. <laughs> and many studies are pointing to evidence that those of us living in industrialized countries are the loneliest we've ever been. And the reasons for this loneliness are complex but it seems like we've optimized for a transactional, fast, and efficient food system that we've forgotten the social role food plays in bringing people together. So in 2010, I set out to explore this disconnect. I received a Fulbright research grant to study Syrian food culture in Aleppo. I spent nine months in tiny kitchens listening to women who taught me the value of an afternoon rolling grape leaves. Stories that started with a single recipe ended in a million personal revelations. And what I thought was originally going to be a project about food ended up teaching me values of diversity, hospitality, and communal practices that have connected people for thousands of years. To understand Aleppo's diversity is to understand its history. This is a city that's been conquered and reconquered many times. And under the Ottoman Empire, it established itself as a bustling merchant city. It was a hub of ethnic and religious diversity. It was the nexus for three continents linking east and west along the Silk Road. From Armenians and Assyrians, to Christians and Circassians, to Jews, Kurds, and Muslims, these communities collectively claimed Aleppo as part of their shared identity. So you can think of a city's culinary heritage as a ledger, a living record of all the people who cultivated that land. And there's a beautiful story of diversity in one of my favorite Aleppan desserts called Heitaliye. My grandparents brought this dessert with them to Venezuela, and my mom used to make it for us growing up. I never understood why, but it always had to be served in these traditional porcelain bowls that looked different than anything else in our cabinets. What I later learned was that this dessert made its way to Aleppo from China 
along the Silk Road. And the family who is most famous for Haitaliye in Aleppo were the Al Haitalanis, hailing from the Khorasan region in modern day Iran. So, in one dish, we can see the culmination of these varied influences. Now, the travelers along the Silk Road were met with hospitality because hospitality is such an important value across the region. In Semitic tribal culture, if a stranger appears at your door, you're supposed to feed them and shelter them for three days before asking any questions. <laughs> this reminds me of a trip to Basuta, a small Kurdish farming village in the outskirts of Aleppo. Now, as we were approaching the village, our van broke down on the side of the road. And because Basuta is famous for this, their pomegranates, I took this opportunity to go exploring on my own. I had my camera strapped around my neck, and I'm sure I stood out like a sore thumb. <laughs> I started weaving through rows and rows of pomegranate trees when I stumbled upon a farmer who was crouched over a mountain of his pomegranates. When I snapped this photo of him, he turned around and greeted me with a smile. What was beautiful about this moment is that without thinking twice, without asking who I was or why I was there, he grabbed the pomegranate from his pile, cracked it open, and offered it to me. Food remains the ultimate manifestation of hospitality in Middle Eastern culture. We see common themes of these teachings in the three major monotheistic religions. And in fact, Abraham had a personal connection to Aleppo. The city was founded around this historic hill where it's believed Abraham once milked his herd of sheep on this very hill and distributed that milk to the poor. The word for milk in Aramaic is halaba, which is where we get the Arabic name for Aleppo, halab. Now, these traditions, they evolved over time, interwoven with pride and honor. Whether or not you have anything to give, generosity or karam remains an important marker in Syrian society. And even though I grew up immersed in Syrian culture, it was sometimes difficult for me to navigate the nuances of these social contracts. Syrians express their love through food. <laughs> They always want you to eat more, and you cannot say no. So I learned to strategically declare I was full before I was actually full. <laughs> and one day, over a plate of Aleppo kebabs, in an attempt to express how full I truly, truly was, I blurted out that I had already had seven kebabs. When those words came out of my mouth, the entire room fell silent. After an awkward moment, the hosts laughed and explained to me that counting your food signals that you're worried there's not enough food to go around. <laughs> it shatters the sense of abundance. And it also reduces a moment of hospitality and sharing into a transactional experience. What I learned is that in the Middle Eastern culture, food and hospitality are not only intertwined, they're inseparable. For thousands of years, the act of preparing a meal was a collaborative experience. It literally took a village to put food on the table. Harvesting olives, rolling grape leaves, baking bread. These tasks were as much collaborative as they were practical. Now, I used to think some Syrian dishes are unnecessarily complex. Why do the stuffed grape leaves have to be so, so tiny? Why does kibbe have to be shaped like a football with perfectly pointy tips on each end? And if there was an easy way or a complicated way of preparing a dish, my host mom would often opt for the more complicated route, especially if guests were coming. What I learned is that this complexity invited opportunities to gather. And even the layout of homes supported this con connected model of living through shared courtyards and large gathering spaces. My childhood was spent running around with cousins while my mom caught up with aunts and sitto, my grandmother, over a pile of parsley. After hours and hours of chopping, 
I remember the wood cutting boards would be stained green. And the sign of a good tabbouleh is how much finely chopped parsley is in the mix. And using a food processor, if you're wondering, is completely out of the question. <laughs> so something as simple as chopping parsley for tabbouleh created an opportunity to gather. You share a different level of depth when you're just sitting over a cutting board for an hour. You share the details that may not seem worth mentioning. But these small moments are where connections are made. Now, it's worth pointing out that we see this collaborative approach to cooking across many cultures around the world, from the tiny tortellini in Bologna to forming tamales in Puebla, these communal practices were meant to be done together. These dishes were designed to be done as a group. And now we see this collaborative approach extend beyond the home. So today, we outsource in ways that completely disconnect us from the process. But traditionally, outsourcing meant finding local efficiencies. Families rely on butchers and bakers for their meal preparations. And there are still some dishes in Aleppo today that are prepared this way, like the Armenian meat pies, lahme vajin. Now, every family has their own secret recipe for their meat mixture, which they make at home, and then they send that meat mixture to the local baker who forms and bakes each pie to send back to the family. These interdependent networks were not only practical, but they're also opportunities to build relationships. They give us a sense of community. The war in Syria and the devastation of infrastructure has required families to rely on these networks for their survival. As Syrians spread around the world, their culture remains alive through these values that they carry with them. They're able to reconstruct a sense of home through these shared traditions, regardless of geography. We're all searching for authentic experiences to help us connect with one another. Our digital lives have left us with a hollow sense of connectedness. As humans, we crave deep, meaningful interactions and struggle to find them. And yet, one of the most powerful mediums for connection is not only right in front of us, it's something that we do every day we eat. Let's think more about the role food plays in our lives, not just as a source of sustenance, but as a way to build relationships, create community, and to support our own well-being. If there's anything we can do to honor Aleppo's living legacy, it's to practice what makes their culture so rich and vibrant. As my grandmother taught me, extending your table can be done well with a few basic ingredients and some memorable details. Pick a day to host a few close friends and family. Prepare the food and eat the food together. Make someone feel like they're the most important person sitting at your counter. Eat well. Sahtain. Thank you very much.